Hello chess friends, this is International Master Valero Leop and today I'm going to show you some of the key moments of the candidate games. Uh, I think this is one of the brilliant, one of the best tournaments that I've actually seen lately and I'd like to cover with you some of the most in instructive learning points that I was able to um, come across recently. I do hope that you get to learn uh, with me. And so what we're going to talk about are the games of Vladimir Kramnik. Now, Kramnik is on fire. And that whole tournament, he was able to, I mean, just do some incredible games. And while they're definitely more challenging to understand, I'll try my best to help you um, really learn as best from each. Kramnik was actually in a great shape from the beginning. He made a mistake. But nevertheless, his games represent an incredible value of uh, strategy as well as perfect, in my opinion, um, you know, tactical understanding. Despite his couple losses that he had, I still do believe that he can come back. And I think that uh, his games were just too, quite inspiring, in my opinion. So I'm going to show you a couple of uh, the brilliant games. Again, we're going to talk about the tournament from the most instructive points, not just um, generally. So here's a game that he played versus uh, Alexander Grischuk. This is a, a beautiful game that I came across recently, and this is it. It was played in the first round. So Kramnik was white, and he began with, uh, like, actually, he, he annotated himself that this is a very rare move. Yet, this is the Rubinstein variation, as I call it. Very often, this system was adopted by Rubinstein. Being the main goal is that white sets up for bishop b2 and a very fair command towards the center. Does it take time for him to do this whole thing? Yes, it does. But it's okay, because all that time is essentially going to pay off really well as white sets up the bishop on the b2, the knight on the c3, the pawn on the c4, and the rest of the pieces on good, effective positions. Let's take a look and see what is da what's happening. Black played queen a5, and then there's bishop b2. Now, I want you to understand that opening is never about huge tactics. Opening is always about consistent development. When you're able to do that and do that well, everything else is almost going to come uh, by itself correctly. Just like you get your pieces right, then you get the attack, you get the pressure, you get everything. So with that in mind, ultimately white played alongside um, the move bishop b2. So what does black do in that case? Well, he actually chose to play this move, but then white doesn't care because he continues with e3. What's so exciting about this position isn't just the fact that, uh, you know, white has the, the dark square bishop opposing against blacks, but also the fact that black can't move his knight out of the way. If black moves his knight away, we're going to exchange the g7, and we're going to be very successful in that way. So little by little, things start playing good. What does black do? Well, he castles. White plays c4. Now, I want you to take a look at this position and see how white is playing it. It is not about tactics. Everything in the opening is about control in the center and a fast development of each and every one of your pieces. Everything else is going to come later. For now, this is what we care about. So white plays c4, black plays b6, and then white plays bishop to the e2. Beautiful. If you look at this, now you get to understand uh, what this whole thing is about. White is getting ready to castle. He'll be able to do knight b4, follow up with rook c1, maybe bishop f3. It's great. Should b7, castles. Queen c7 and rook c1. So far, you might say that this is a very standard type of development. There's nothing big happening. But I want you to think that there is more beyond everything that looks like a simple development. Why it starts now a maneuver that changes everything. It shifts the knight onto a much more powerful position. And in a couple moves time, that shift in line with the attack turns this into an incredibly effective and brilliant.
position. What goes now? Well, knight d1 isn't just a fancy move, okay? You want to know that. This move is down for the specific reason that once the knight is in the line, it's going to move forward to c3, and it's actually going to help us out with the idea of going of coming out to d5. It's perfect. It's effective. And this is how you do it. Slowly, gradually regrouping the pieces. Black did now knight d7, and then he played rook c8. So what, how does white improve now? Take a moment, because we've already opened up the road for the queen. We've gotten our knight a much better position. I mean, for the most part, this whole thing really looks good. But that still doesn't answer the question, what to do now? And that's the biggest question you've got to be thinking about right now. How does white follow through here and make his game better? Take a moment. And you might want to think about this position carefully. Because, you know, this is a great position. First thing that I would like to tell you about is that in a position like this, you have to start with the worst place piece. Yes, that's often just one piece, but sometimes it's more. Right now, there is a huge piece that just doesn't feel right. What is it? It's the queen. Queen in D1 that doesn't look good. So the first thing that White wanted to do is fix it. How do we fix it? We fix it by playing rook to c2. And then what we get to find is that it's not just that little line in this position, but it's also the fact that we can play rook to the d, rook there, queen on, queen on a1, I'm sorry. And then by playing queen on a1, this is going to help us to jump in with 95 if necessary, if need be. It is perfect. Queen BA, Queen E1. Kramnik used something that I call is coordination between the pieces. When you have a good coordination, when you have a good connection between each of your pieces, this helps a lot because then you can use the power of every single one of them in order to exercise more challenges against the opponent. Now, it's like not just about having the queen on d2. It is about having the queen and the bishop connected in, ID, in line towards an idea of knight d5. It's very good. Black played a6, rook d2. What white is doing here is called improvement. Basically, it means that you set up every piece to a position or square from where it can be most helpful. And little by little, it helps in the long run. Now white is setting up his pieces towards the square of d5, and that's really going to work, I have to say, quite well at the same time. Because when black does rook to the e8, this is where white jumps in with rook d1. The pieces are great. Everything that white has in line with the advance is prepared. Black does bishop a8, and then white played knight g5. Interestingly enough, most chess players over here are likely going to jump ahead and look for tactics. But not Kramnik, he didn't. All that Kramnik wanted to do from this position is to take on some of those bad or rather idle pieces and turn them good. Can we do this? Absolutely. Is it going to take time? Absolutely it is. But it doesn't matter. Because when we go for it, when we do it like this, like the G5, Everything fits in, not h3. It's important that you think about the long-term prospect of any given piece. Like the long-term prospect for a white knight right now being the, the opportunity to go for f4 and uh, actually go ahead instantly against the d5. It is great. Simple, effective, and easy. If you look at most of black's own pieces, they don't do anything. Black played b5. Interestingly enough, Black's intention was very clear. He wanted to open up and attack on the other side of the board, but um, didn't really matter because right this moment, once the pawn goes to b5, White is actually playing with knight f4, b takes the c, and bishop takes the c4. See, take a look right now on how powerful the whole build up, the whole development actually is for White. Everything works. 
The space works. The beat. The build up works. Black plate with the move of rook to g5. But then white sets up his own knight on the d5 square. That's even more powerful than anything earlier. It is great. Activity is great. And the continuation too. Black did knight e5 in hope to, I don't know, come together and advance. And now white does bishop e2. Look at the momentum. Now you're going to find out probably something interesting. White does not actually rush it. Now why doesn't he rush it? It would make most sense if he would rush it. Right? I mean, just after all, that's the idea. Let's just rush it through and then find out. No. No, 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 and no again. Rushing things through in a position like that is only going to cause more trouble. Why did not want this? Not yet. Not at this point. What he really wanted to do was to make sure that the pieces that he has can maintain, can keep up their powerful positions in order to force the opponent to worry. With knight d5, we understand now that if black plays with knight takes d5, there is going to be knight takes to d5. And then there is going to be the idea of playing f4 and many others. You see, the trouble is there. Black is in a horrible looking position. There's not much he can make. Well, after that, black played knight e4. Ravnik really did not like this move, but it's like, Black is actually attempting some sort of a tactical idea or challenge that comes with none of his pieces really prepared for it. So, why this does work before? It's interesting enough how something as simple as the idea, as the concept of centralizing, can do so much damage. Pretty much right now, um, in this case, White has the knight on the d5, We've got the bishop from the b2 to exercise more pressure and attack. And we see black. Yes, we see black awfully developed. No, de no, no direction. No strong pieces. Nothing good at all. Nothing great. So now what does black do? He played knight c5, hoping to come back. But it didn't matter because white now plays with h4. Now, when you already get so much development and good pieces... You don't need much to, to break him through. The truth is, White didn't need at all that much. All we needed was uh, one or two type of attacks and threats, and uh, that was it. It was done. Look at that. H4 was wonderful. Seeing this as a move, Black was apparently not liking this position no more, but there's just not too much he can do, really. So there was that. Um, now, with that in mind, apparently there is more for him to hurt and, you know, evaluate, but really just, this is painful, this is bad. So what's happening in this moment is um, later, I mean, right, up, right at this moment, Black just continued with um, the move of um, Rook F5. And what's happening in this moment? Why does E4? Every move from this moment on is an actual threat. It is a specific problem that causes Black to make more mistakes or, you know, like, worry even more. Every move is beautiful. Like, let's think about this from the Black perspective. I don't think he's got anything. I don't believe he's got anything good because he doesn't. It is hard. It is challenging. But uh, that's all a result of what, what was able, able to build up for so that the whole tactical sequence works. And it does, believe me, it does. It's beautiful, it's effective, and it works brilliantly. As why does it this way, you know, Black has um, little to nothing that he can do in this type of position. And uh, so Rook takes F4, and then after Knight takes F4, Okay, and uh, actually, in case that black played knight xd, and now remember this, if you have a material advantage, the one thing that you really wish to do is going to be to press him, to press your opponent back. Got to do it this way. Now, as we are actually able to play in this moment, black has a problem. Why? Well, it's uh, actually 
a huge issue. It doesn't have anything to do, and uh, it doesn't have any you know de development setup, whatever it is. So what's happening? What happens in this position? So he played that type of a move, interestingly, and um, so after this candidate, apparently, white is perfect. What does he do? Rook b4. You may be wondering now what would cause that that type of move. Uh, well, in fact, after that and rook to b4, black played queen to the a7. Than it's a great question. What to do right now? Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. See, what you've got to do is to think about stabilizing. This is actually a nice move that sets up a trap, but more than that is the fact that it stabilizes. It takes away the knight, which was previously really powerful, to a much more of a backward position, and yet it is out of harm's way. It's perfect. And as, as soon as this move was done, now you could see the real challenge for black. He cannot go anywhere. He can't do anything. And then after black played with the move of a5, and white doesn't move, rook to the b5. Now e6, and of course, transformation. Every advantage should lead to a point where we have an, an opportunity for transformation. The transformation is usually a kind of move with which we open up the opponent's position, or we threaten them in different ways, and that's how we deliver uh, you know, we're breakthrough, the, the, you know, so we can attack. That's, it's quite excellent right now in this moment because this is exactly what White needs. He needed a move to help him to open up. So, in fact, after the move of Rook takes to the D, takes the Bishop takes the, not only the Black has no counterplay, but uh, actually Black can't exchange. And then after that, Queen to the C5, White trades. And now what should white do now? Hmm. Think about this. We have a great looking queen. We have a wonderful knight. Everything looks perfect. So actually, the first thing that you've got to do is exchange exchange the opponent's good pieces. Now, some would say that when we exchange, we lose a little bit of our advantage or the power, which could be truth. However, in this case, if black chooses to trade, we're going to take back with the rook. we got the bishop coming in. We have the rook out there. And this is very powerful out there. It's a beautiful sequence. Black cannot do, the, cannot do anything. He had to exchange it and play bishop c6. But then white plays rook to the d2. He's getting, we're getting the idea of playing bishop to the c4. We're going to have that ability to follow up with knight d5. It's wonderful. So this is a very interesting way to follow in this position. Little by little, you know, all you have to do is expand. Gradually take away the resources or challenges of your opponent so you can't do much more. And it was wonderful because really the truth is that black can't do anything. No shots, no tactics, no uh, no ways on how he can uh, make anything anything wonderful. It was perfect and great at the same time. It was really really uh, nicely played by white from the very beginning, and uh, black was losing. So so basically he attempted to play rook to the b8 in this moment. Of course he did. I mean he had to. But uh, it doesn't matter because um, now with that with that in mind, white simply continues. What does he do? Well, he plays with rook to the c2. He knew that with that rook in the c2, everything's going to work well. We have that chance to think about uh, you know maybe bishop to the c4. And when black uh, you know went right down with his own bishop, awfully apparently, you know, in a bad way. So now white knows it. Stability is great. White has a good control. So how do we advance there? It's actually not that difficult. Just go 
slow. This is key. In a position like that, you cannot allow yourself to fa to fasten up the play and do it indifferently. You gotta go gradual. White played now rook c7. This was an amazing move because one of the reasons why that works is because of the black weaknesses. He's got that bad e7 pawn that is being attacked. Then the a is being is being attacked brilliantly, and uh, that's just great. Every single piece right now for White shows him, shows and proves that um, his game is amazing. And uh, you know, so in fact, after that move, uh, then White plays with the move of um, B to the A, and then um, actually here, and then King H two, now Rook to B four, A five. It's perfect, and. Um, in fact, after that move, it's it's amazing. Black played rook takes h4, rook a4, bishop c6. But now white has a pass pawn, a strong rook out there. And um, that's just amazing. See, step by step, all you would like to do in such a position is improve. And uh, in fact, stepping up the pieces, bringing them forward, attacking and uh, actually knight h5 then white plays with the move of this one and so this is really really powerful and uh, so actually after knight b5 we get knight b6 we can get that the square out there available wow i mean i love that <laughs> it's just it's really amazing how quickly something like this can work and how brilliant it is in the meantime so just Kramnik's strategy through this whole game was based on one thing. It was about consistent build-up and something that gave him the chance to not only coordinate but brilliantly improve every single one of his pieces. It was amazing to see positional play from that rank, from that level, being uh, you know utilized in a game like this. It's just I haven't seen anything like that for quite a while. And I was definitely very impressed to see, um, you know, like such sequences going on. It's uh, it's beautiful. So I do, I definitely do love, um, you know, these, these games. And I think they were, they were pretty great. They were pretty, you know, powerful and everything. So, um, yeah. Now what I want to do is I would like to bring up the next game that was uh, pretty exciting. This was again played by Kramnik. However, he played against someone else. He played that game and he won versus... Um, okay, hold on for a second. Let me just set it up. The first one was against Grishchuk and the other one was against Aronian. Now, this was an excellent game. Brilliantly played. Everything was wonderful in that game. Let me show it to you. In this game, Kramnik was playing with the black and... This time he started with something that I would call is a bit weird. In an opening known as more mostly as the exchange variation in Real Lopez, something that a lot of people tend to follow and play, as a matter of fact, what Black did, interestingly enough, was a smart sequence. What did he do? He played alongside the move of Dedex in the C, Queen E7, and now as black cannot play bishop g4, we obviously see it, oh, why we why this can't happen. What is coming in this type of position is black considers and continues with the move of rook g8. A brilliant, brilliant move. Simply setting up for the kind of, uh, for, for the kind of g5, g4 that comes up. And uh, so that is perfect way to follow very very interesting out there and amazing so what do we do well ultimately in this position after that was played white played with the move of king to the h1 so he actually decided to uh, simply come up with that move then white plays knight h5 so this is quite interesting What's going on after that? Why are we playing this? Well, you could see why. 
Because first and foremost, we're actually getting the chance to, you know, first and foremost, get those pieces into the play. But more importantly, we use the stability in the center to provide a quick way to open the opponent's king. This is very, very interesting. What is going on in this moment? White has nothing. Most of his own pieces are back. And uh, it's amazing. Next move. Take a look. What's happening? That white plays C3 is preparing to advance. I think that he needs to do this type of a move in order to achieve anything. But then black plays with the move of pawn up to the g5 out there. So this is amazing in that type of position. And, you know, after we continue with this move of g5, white plays knight takes to the d5. And uh, what is very, very interesting is that after knight takes to the e5, white does black doesn't care. Most of the white pieces are undeveloped. When your opponent's suffering from, from good development, all you would like to do is to open up the position and engage into that attack out there. So all you like to do is open up the position, engage the tactics, and then you actually find out how difficult it is going to be for, for white to do anything. Now, you can't open up. And then after the move of uh, pawn up to the d4, and we can actually realize that in, in here, black is playing with the move of um, bishop to d6. So this is a beautiful move that not only helps us to attack against the opponent, but it's actually helping us to bring up a queen on h4, g dix h, and uh, it's amazing. The sequence is brilliant. White's pieces are down, and then, of course, white has to do g3. And black exchanges, takes, and then we have queen dix d5. Simple, effective, and impossible for white to cover. Uh, what's really incredible about, usually about these positions, is uh, the advance. You need to advance against your opponent. You need to make this, you know, like consistent. And it was great. What does White do? I mean, it's kind of hard actually to say about this position. What is he going to do? It's it's not it's not simple. It's not easy. In that line, he thought he actually decided to continue with um, move of Queen D4, hoping that perhaps he's going to be able to block and neutralize some of the white attacking, some of the black attacking pieces. But it didn't really matter because right now he's not doing anything. Black is not going to exchange the queens. He'll simply continue and maintain the attack out there. This is a very powerful move. And uh, it's an interesting way to follow. And then ultimately we can continue with the move of uh, bishop d7. And then we can have long side castling. And it's perfect. So after that, queen e7, white plays with the move h4. Okay. And what are we going to do right now? Because, in fact, uh, almost everything is well placed. The development's perfect. The control is great in this moment. So what do we do now? A lot of the development is perfect, but we can't make this happen. Unless there's something more. Well, now what happened actually is that black played c5. Driving the queen out of the way. And then of course there's bishop to the bishop to the e6. Beautiful. We got the possibility to attack against the queen. Long side castles is gonna be a great idea. And uh, you know, we just continue with the pressure. Step by step, everything is great. And then white has to do queen to the b5. He actually checks here. Then we have that move of c6. Queen to a4, and pawn up to the f5. See, 
What is really important about this position is that rule number one, rule number one, what you'd like to be considering is don't worry. As long as your opponent does not, have, does not have the development in place, there's absolutely nothing. No tactical things, nothing dangerous. You just have to continue going and constantly work out the better pieces. So now white plays bishop to the g5. And uh, actually after that, black plays with rook to the g5. We don't care about the material. It's not about what pieces you've got. It's about what pieces you could use. The truth is that majority of white's pieces have nothing to do. And that gives us a wonderful chance to attack against the opponent. We can hit the g3. And, uh, you know, that's... It's brilliant. We have the F takes to the G in this position. And um, so this is very, very important. You know, uh, interestingly enough in this, in this position is that White can't go anywhere. He had to play with that type of move, queen to the D1, but uh, now Black plays rook to the D8. And uh, just that's... That's really, really powerful out there. So just what you've got to do in such a situation is constantly think about the pieces. How do I set them up so I can create more threats and I can make more problems? When with that in mind, of course, white has to play with queen c1. And we have f takes the g here. And surely now there's rook d3. How are the white pieces or any of the white pieces useful in this position? Truth is, they're not. This is really just critical here. None of his pieces are in any kind of condition to fight back or do anything. So we don't care. Just continue. Rook d3 is brilliant. White plays rook d1. Of course, bishop d5. That's the final straw of the attack. In case white takes, he's going to get checkmated. If he plays a move like uh, you know rook takes d3, it's the same. If he plays a move of e takes to the d, we're likely going to play with a move of queen e4 here check and certainly cannot defend the checkmate coming from a queen and the rook all together so that is a powerful way to follow in this position and uh, i don't like a chance to set things right and attack him what was so wonderful about that is the inability for white to do any defense and when he thought that finally the queen is gone g2 followed and he resigned g1 is a killer so it's like next move we have g1 we have f2 and once the king is forced to move in the second rank, game is over. I really love most of those two games. There were others, many great games, and perhaps I can cover them next time. But those two, they were really brilliant. Thank you all for joining me today, and I'll definitely speak to you next day.